the only reason that I think it's advisable for me to do this stuff in silhouette um, is the unknown. Uh, I got the opportunity to deal as a go-between for the Medellin cartel with financial institutions, including what was the seventh largest privately held bank in the world. The UN does a report every year attempting to identify the, for lack of a better term, underground economy, the money from illegal activity, which in this last year's report was pegged at 2.1 trillion from all types of illegal activities. And of that, four to 500 billion from the sale of illegal drugs around the world. The US are number one in the consumption of illegal drugs and generate about 65 billion of that 400 billion um, here within the United States. When I was in the business, about $10,000 per kilo was the profit that would be coming back to Colombia. You know, they were doing thousands upon thousands of kilos. Each deal was producing $5 million, $10 million. It's $160 million a month. The logistics of the cash becomes a major problem. They need professional money launderers who can then take that money and safely transform it into a legitimate appearing uh, revenue stream. And that's really what I did uh, for them. That in those famous meetings in the, in the movies with Deep Throat and, and the reporters, they kept telling them, follow the money. It's going to take you to, to the real power. Um, that is the best way to identify and prosecute the people involved in command and control. Um, in major criminal organizations. The initial intention of Sea Chase was to go after the money launderers who were supporting the command and control of the Medellin cartel. My thinking was that we've spent a lot of time putting together a sophisticated front for this mythical Robert Musella. Why can't he do the same thing that any other dirty guy does and walk into a bank and ask them to open up an account in Panama? It's pretty easy. Um, so, and that's what I did. But when I was driving down Ashley Drive in uh, Tampa, I just happened to glance out of the corner of my eye and these huge gold letters said Bank of Credit and Commerce International. I'm not a rocket scientist, but I thought they probably open up foreign accounts. <laughs> so I called the bank, very first meeting, I explained to them. I simply said, I'm a manager of uh, the financial affairs of a series of clients in Colombia who have businesses here that generate a large amount of capital. And it's my responsibility to help them to be able to get that money back into other countries in a way where it's not obvious to governments. And the guy says to me, well, you know, what you're describing is called the black market. You need to be careful. Only the stupid people get caught. Get yourself involved in a lot of cash generating businesses. So you can take their cash, put it in there, and then transfer the money in so you've got a legitimate cover for why you get the cash. I was amazed. I was, the guy didn't even know me. And he's talking so openly to me. And right in the beginning, he said, you know, well, we can move the money into an offshore account, put it in a CD, and then we can give you a loan in another part of the world. Nobody will know about the CD. All things that are very, very close to uh, the type of activity one would carry out in order to either evade income taxes or to launder money. The international banking community is today doing the same thing that BCCI and its officers did 20 years ago. Um, and they're getting deferred prosecutions for the most part. A Senate investigation has found that HSBC Bank for years allowed Mexican drug cartels to launder billions of dollars through the bank's U.S. operation. According to a Senate report that just was disclosed yesterday, HSBC brought in $300 billion every single year. And the people that manage that, amongst other things, they were buying cash, U.S. cash, in Mexico, in Guatemala, Honduras, all of the high, high risk areas for the collection of cash that's been smuggled out of the United States and then tries to be uh, propped up to look legal and bring it back. Pretty much it's a, 
it's a common practice within the international banking community. You know, we went hunting for the biggest whale, <laughs> and we're in the belly of that whale because we're at the point of no return. We are conduits for the seventh largest privately held bank in the world and a cartel. And we're dealing with people who are at the highest levels on both sides. I came to a point where I felt what I was doing was so important that if taking the risks that needed to be taken meant being killed, I was okay with that. Pablo Escobar's principal advisor, a guy who I dealt with personally, a lawyer by the name of Santiago Uribe, mastermind of international money laundering operations, so much power that on a given day he could die, decide who would live and die. I was in meetings when he ordered people to be killed. Under pressure, for me, it's very difficult for me to react to a name other than my first name. Probably best to have the first initial of the last name be the same as mine. It needs to be ethnically accurate. It needs to be geogra geographically accurate. I made a bio in a way where my lies would not be reaches in lies. It's emotionally a very stressful situation. You've got to deal with things that are undercover. You can't give your family 100%. There's no way. Some people get so into trying to do this that they become very vulnerable. They suffer things like Stockholm Syndrome, where they begin to align themselves in truly liking and becoming closer to the targets than you are to your own office. I had to give a piece of my real heart to them in my interactions with them uh, in order for them to perceive me as a real person. I mean, I dealt with their spouses, I dealt, dealt with their children. Um, I felt terrible about the impact that I've had on the innocent members of their families. They perceived me to be a friend. They wouldn't have come to what they thought was my wedding to get arrested if they, if they didn't feel that way. Almost all the top executives were under arrest. They'd been charged with being part of a huge international money laundering scheme. They were caught after being invited to a fake wedding set up by the customs service. Of course, the wedding never took place. Uh, instead, uh, uh, 11 uh, defendants were arrested, including seven as they proceeded to a purported bachelor party. They were very focused on making sure these arrests were done in October, three, four weeks before the election. It was the number one thing in the news for many, many months, and certainly for all the time before, uh, before the election. But I think there's a chance that we could have achieved more had we kept the operation going for a few more months. The bank, BCCI, had a long-standing relationship with the intelligence community, with the CIA, and with some of our ally nations and their intelligence community. And I don't think it was an accident during one of the meetings that I was instructed, okay, just stick to the issue of the drug money and leave everything else alone. Now, everything else, I was beginning to report that there was at least two banks, two U.S. banks that were secretly owned by BCCI. And one of them was First American Bank. And of course, the head of First American Bank was Clark Clifford, who at the time was pretty much considered to be the godfather of the Democratic Party and the former Secretary of Defense. I do not know what went on inside of the Bank of Credit and Commerce. As the operation's over, I'm the key witness because I'm the one who recorded most of the conversations. Two U.S. agencies received information from a witness uh, about a threat on my life, a contract on my life. So um, I and my family um, left the country, came back, um, assuming another identity. It was my view that that was probably the best way to provide security um, for my family. Um, there were some plans of trying to have armed guards with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I refused it. I said, you know, you're, all you're going to do is put even more psychological pressure on my family than 
uh, than is necessary. And you know and I know in 30 days you're going to say, well, we can't really tell for sure if there's a contract, so they'll stop with the protection. And then I would have been sitting there with the same name. I've spent years creating identities, so I was very confident that an extra identity that I had established would be um, the best way for me to go, to be able to be difficult to find. There had been no bank prior to this that had been charged with money laundering um, or that had been convicted of money laundering. So um, this was really a kind of a pioneer case. I'd seen published reports of 40 some million dollars being spent toward their defense, but it was certainly well in the tens of millions of dollars just for the main case in Tampa. I think they tried to they tried to beat me up more than they probably should have. And I think that, that probably psychologically in the minds of the jurors wound up working to the government's advantage because it was piling on. I testified every single court day for three months. Um, and half of that, a little more than half of that was cross-examination. I mean, um, each one of them had their own uh, defense issue that they, they were clearly a very well uh, organized orchestra. They had a plan. The potential of Stockholm Syndrome, role reversal, you know, had I lost it. Um, so they were very, very good lawyers. Um, they were well orchestrated um, in their attacks. and. Um, um, but apparently not in the jury's mind all that effective because everyone was convicted.